Okay. Um, well, we are going to go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome everyone to the uh, meeting. We are going to be going over the application process for renewal funding for the upcoming 2021 continuum of care process. Um, so hopefully you are all in the right place. So here is um, an overview of what we're going to be going over today. Um, just going to touch on some housekeeping tips. I'm going to do a, a bit of a recap of the 2020 competition. I'm going to be going over the timeline for this coming year, this coming competition. We are going to be looking at some details as it relates to the renewal project application scoring. I'm going to be going over briefly some policies where you can access that information and then obviously questions. So as we go along, feel free to type your questions into the chat box. I'll pause um, occasionally throughout so folks can ask questions um, verbally as well. So just um, a couple of quick housekeeping. Um, everyone, I do ask that you please keep yourself on mute um, if you are not already. If I can tell that there's some background noise coming from your end, I will mute you. Um, but please just hopefully at this point in our lives, um, we have learned uh, the Zoom protocol of keeping yourself on mute unless you have a question. So today's webinar is being recorded and the recording and the slides will be posted to our website um, within the next couple of days. So your uh, participation in this webinar is um, strongly encouraged, um, but not required in order to be considered for renewal funding. For those of you who have been around uh, for a while, you may recall that typically we would have this kind of meeting in person and in-person attendance was you know, mandatory. We, we kind of, now that we're not meeting in person, have shifted some of that requirements knowing that it can be difficult sometimes to get on a webinar. So um, you are still eligible for renewal funding even if you don't attend here today or even if you never watch the recording, which you are um, encouraged to do so though because it will be um, useful information hopefully to you. So um, again, the materials from today will be posted to our website. The URL is uh, there and oh, actually what we already do have posted is the um, application form. All of the information that I'm gonna be going over today is already posted to our website as well as the application form posted there in Word format that you can download and submit. Uh, the self-scoring tools that I'll touch on briefly towards the end are there as well as other policies. Basically everything you're gonna need to know for the competition is there on our website. So you can um, access it easily. So bookmark that website and so you can get back to it easily. All right, so I wanna give um, a quick recap of the 2020 competition and just to sort of bring folks up to speed because 2020 was an unusual year. <laughs> um, so last spring, we did kick off the local renewal application process. You may recall that we kind of went back and forth and, and had removed some scoring criteria and we pushed back deadlines and there were some changes that we made throughout as we were learning to sort of um, pivot and accommodate needs um, as we were all trying to deal with the early days of the pandemic. But we did go through a process last year for all of the renewal applications where applications were reviewed and scored on certain evaluation criteria. You all received those scores and it was around August of last year. At that time, last by last August, we still didn't know what was happening with the 2020 competition. It was not until January of this year that we got word from HUD that they officially canceled the 2020 competition and they just automatically renewed um, renewal projects. So all of um, our renewal projects were automatically renewed. We have a list of those funded projects on our website, but essentially it's everyone that was currently funded was automatically renewed. You should be receiving your fiscal year 2020 grant agreements. If you have not already, um, that information is gonna come directly from the HUD field office. So please be on the lookout for that. I know that HUD was prioritizing grant agreements for grants that had um, start dates within kind of the first half of this calendar year, just because 
you know, those are a little bit more time sensitive. So if you have a project term that starts, you know, say August, you know, September, October of this year, um, your grant agreement maybe is maybe not the first one that they're going to get out. Um, but again, you should be getting those grant agreements. You will notice um, for many of them that the dollar amount is going to be a little bit higher than last year because HUD always makes those adjustments for um, FMR adjustments. And so that's why you may see a difference in your dollar amount. So because there was no FY 2020 competition, there was also no FY 2020 CUC application and so no CUC application score. So that application score is, you know, to, that's how HUD evaluates us as a COC on our COC performance. Um, there was no application, so there was no score. Um, typically, we would provide, you know, kind of an analysis of that score, but that is not applicable this year. So um, that's sort of a recap of the where things, how things came up about with the 2020 um, competition last year. So for this year's timeline, so the, uh, one of the biggest things that we are all going to have to adjust to is the NOFA is now the NOFO. Um, in the midst of all of the changes we've had to make this past year, this is probably gonna be one of the hardest. Um, that was meant to be a sarcastic comment. Um, so the NOFA, what we usually know as the NOFA, the Notice of Funding Availability, is now the Notice of Funding Opportunity. So in your mind, replace NOFA with NOFO. Uh, that has not yet been released. Um, we anticipate it perhaps being released on sort of a more of a normal timeline, which may mean it may be released July-ish. The NOFO is like the formal communication from HUD on how much funding is available, available funding priorities, um, kind of everything uh, related to the competition. So we're still waiting for that to be released. The timeline, so these next few bullet points um, with the timeline, some of this may be subject to change depending on when the NOFO is released. Uh, the two dates that are not changing right now are the two dates that you see in red for renewal application materials and new project application materials. So renewal application materials are due by June 17th, so it's a month from now. Um, new project applications are going to be due June 25th, um, and there's a webinar on Wednesday uh, where we'll be going over everything related to new projects. So today we're not talking about new projects. I just wanted to at least make everyone aware um, if you are interested in applying for new funding, those applications are going to be due June 25th and there's a webinar on um, Wednesday morning to talk more about that. Um, but for sure, renewal application materials are due June 17th. So for the, kind of the rest of the timeline, what we anticipate is likely in mid-July, um, you will receive your scores. As you know, we um, always have an appeals process you know, that's connected with that scoring. So that will also happen mid-July, early August. Roughly, we anticipate throughout August and September project entry into eSNAPS, which is the online application portal. And roughly mid-September, perhaps late September, we would anticipate the board, the COC board, making um, approving the final project priority ranking list and then submitting everything to HUD. So this is all assuming that the NOFO comes out in early to mid-July. So again, the kind of the latter things in this timeline can be subject to change depending on um, when that NOFO is released. So again, we'll continue to update the timeline on our website and any you know, timely or really relevant um, kind of key dates that you need to be aware of, I do also um, communicate through email as well. Okay. So I am going to now uh, move into talking a bit more about the renewal projects, um, some kind of overarching information to kind of keep in mind. So uh, projects that are expiring in calendar year 2022 and that are not being reallocated are eligible for renewal. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you'll be getting your uh, FY 2020 grant agreements 
um, those grant agreements are for funding that you are going to spend uh, between starting in calendar year 2021 and going through 2022. The funding that you're applying for um, here in the FY 2021 competition um, is for funding that you're going to start spending in 2022 and going into 2023. And what might make this even more exciting is that you might still be spending your FY19 uh, projects, uh, which are going to be ending, you know, sometime this calendar year in 2021. So there's often sort of like three different time frames that you're sort of dealing with, and that can be a little um, confusing. But the the long and the short of it is that for the most part, um, well, really kind of for all of our, the all of these projects that are getting your 2020 grant agreements, those funds will expire in 2022. Um, and therefore, you will need to apply for renewal funding in this upcoming calendar year or upcoming competition. Um, but don't worry, if you are an application that needs to be renewed, I will make sure that you uh, that's part of my role with, with hand just to make sure that we submit everything to HUD that should be um, submitted. Um, I mean, you, you do have to submit things, you know, to hand to make that happen, but um, we'll, we'll make sure that that happens. So renewal funding is not guaranteed. Um, I do, you know, we do say that every year. We don't know what HUD's funding levels are this year. Um, it, because these are renewal grants, um, they're renewed every year. Renewal funding is, is not guaranteed. Projects will be ranked according to our project priority ranking policies. Um, again, for those of you who have been around for a while, you'll know that those policies really outline the order in which we submit those projects to HUD. It's a reflection of our funding priorities. Those policies are set to go to the COC board at their June 7th board meeting um, for the board to uh, vote on to approve. Once those policies are approved, they'll be posted to our website. I think I'll probably record sort of a brief like um, kind of video just sort of walking folks through those policies. I'll make sure that you all have that link as well that you can review that on your own. Um, but just know that uh, those policies are not quite finalized yet, uh, will be finalized at the June board meeting and those will policies will dictate the order in which projects are going to be submitted um, to HUD. All right, I kind of covered on some of this a little bit, but in terms of your project being eligible for renewal, you do need to submit materials as instructed. So whether that's submitting information directly to hand, whether you, you know, submitting things into eSnaps um, within kind of the time frame, which is still forthcoming. Your uh, renewal project does have to score at least 70% on the scoring criteria. That is a standard we've had in place for a number of years. Projects that score under 70% are able to submit an appeal requesting a waiver of that 70% threshold. That then goes through the appeals process um, and the decision is made kind of accordingly on what actions to take there. Um, for those, any agency that's under a, a technical assistance plan, you know, we would look to, for compliance with that. Um, and you do need to be in compliance with HUD regulations. So, you know, if uh, the you know, the COC is informed from HUD that there are, you know, serious concerns or, you know, things that we need to be mindful of. Um, that is all taken into consideration in terms of making these um, decisions on who to submit for renewal funding. Okay, if you give me a moment here, I'm going to switch over um, to the application form. Do, do, do. Okay. Can folks, okay, can folks see the application form? I think I did this correctly. I always have a bit of Zoom paranoia. Okay, we're going to be going over the uh, this is the application packet itself. I'm not going to go through it word by word um, because I know everyone uh, has access to this information. But I am going to go as we go through the this form and this document, highlight um, some uh, you know key things of interest. So when we get into the uh, the scoring criteria, just know that this scoring criteria was developed um, through kind of a multi-step process. 
um, through uh, uh, the Values and Funding Priority Committee in particular. Um, when we developed it, we looked back over performance over the course of 2020 to kind of get a sense of what our data was telling us. Um, we then had a public comment process in all of this, you know, to take into consideration how the pandemic has sort of impacted everything. And as a result of that public comment process made some kind of further adjustments and this final criteria then went to the board at their May board meeting and was um, approved accordingly. So this, uh, again, this packet of information, it's, it is almost 60 pages long, so it's rather detailed. This is all posted on our website. I'm gonna just really um, go through this and I'm gonna, again, uh, some of this I've already covered at a high level, but I'm, there are some things I do wanna highlight here. So I realize I'm sort of scrolling and I hope I'm not making you seasick. Um, but I'm gonna start off with some of the scored criteria and wanna highlight things that we have changed from last year. So as, the, as you go through the document, it really lays out by project type, um, what components you're being evaluated on, what that point value is, the scoring scale, so what percentage you would have to be performing at in order to earn um, certain points. And again, projects do have to earn at least 70% of the points possible in order to be considered for renewal funding. Um, there is a different amount of total points for each project type. Um, there's some nuances there, so that's why it's the percentage of the total points that you have to earn instead of a, excuse me, instead of a set um, number. Um, but there have been some changes from the from last year. So within this first component of what we're going to be looking at, this is a component as it relates to mainstream resources um, and employment. This is a looking at the extent to which the people in your program either gain income while they're in your program or if they've left your program with some type of income, either employment income or cash benefits. Um, one change that we did make when we look at uh, people who left the program with earned income or employment, we changed the scoring scale for our essentially our short term programs, so the rapid or time limited, I should say, our rapid rehousing, transitional housing, and our one joint component project. We did change the scoring scale and essentially kind of lowered some of those performance expectations that needed to be met in order to earn full points. Um, this is done based on you know the result of looking at the data, look in, you know, taking into consideration the public comments, because this is looking back over, you know, 2020. And so we know that with everything that happened in 2020, helping people to gain employment, um, again, for their shorter term programs was going to be more, more challenging. And so that is one um, criteria that was changed. Um, similarly, kind of the next criteria, looking at people who Increase their total cash income. This is looking at, um, again, anyone who was either still in the program as of the end of 2020 or who had left over the course of 2020. For the time limited programs, we likewise changed that scoring scale. Um, again, lowered the performance expectation that needed to be met in order to earn full points, um, kind of for this, the same rationale as given above. And I, and I will say too, I do, we do have linked to our website, a lot more detail on sort of the rationale behind all of these scoring criteria and why we include what we do, why we've made the changes we have. Um, so that information and also the public comments that were received and the responses to those comments. So um, that information is, on our, is available on our website. I'm not gonna go over it here, but we do, you may have that publicly available if you um, want some further reading on that. The next um, kind of change that I want to point out applies to permanent supportive housing projects. Um, so one of the biggest um, kind of scored criteria that we look at for our PSH programs is the extent to which people either remain in permanent supportive housing as of the end of 2020 or exit PSH to other permanent housing. Obviously, the purpose of these programs is to help end a person's homelessness. And so making sure they have permanent housing is the way that we measure that. 
Um, as you can see, sort of that highlighted point there, that is a change we made to the scoring scale. Uh, um, typically, any project that was performing in that lower range, that 75 to 79 percent, really wouldn't have earned any points. But again, in light of the pandemic, wanted to make that you know an option in case there was a project that um, did have struggles with some performance in that respect. I will say, just looking at some preliminary data. Um, it really looks like, for the most part, our PSH projects did perform quite well on this component, which is which is great. But again, we did make that change um, just in response to to what we've seen in the uh, over the course of the past year. Uh, one minute, uh, note I do want to make: when we look at the scored criteria, we do exclude certain individuals from the calculation. So. Uh, people that have an exit destination um, that they've you know, passed away, or if they exited to foster care, hospital or residential or non-psychiatric facility, or a nursing home are excluded from the calculations. And we also exclude people who um, entered and exited the project within 2020, but never had a housing move-in date. And so we know that way, you know, because of how coordinated entry works and because of how you have to enter data into HMIS, you may receive a referral from coordinated entry. You do an entry, you know, project start date, you enter them into HMIS, you begin trying to make contact with the client or trying to work with them and something happens and you perhaps can never contact them. Perhaps once you do contact them, they're already housed, they decline the services. There's a number of things that can happen, which then you need to exit them out of your program because you, you're not going to be working with them, um, but you've never moved them into housing. And so we take that into consideration. And so those clients are essentially exited from kind of backed out from the calculations. Um, and within the self scoring tools, um, I do go into all of sort of the detail and the math behind how we do that. Mm -hmm. Um, the next change that was made for permanent supportive housing projects um, is around utilization rates. So his historically, we'll, we would look at uh, project utilization or project occupancy on uh, sort of the standard four point in time count dates throughout the year, sort of the last Wednesday of January, April, July, and October. This year, we've added a fifth date, the end of December, um, just really in recognition that it gives us a broader scope of really how the project performed um, and considering that, you know, perhaps towards the latter part of 2020, you know, we were learning new ways to operate and to house people over, you know, within uh, the constraints that we were operating under. And so it just wanted to recognize that by the end of the year, you know, things may have improved a little bit and picked up a little bit. And so we wanted to make sure that we reflected that. Mm. Um, so probably the next biggest change for PSH providers is the review of uh, the six policies. So you may recall last spring when before we really knew everything that was going to be happening, we had intended to have a review as a scored element, um, these six policies from the PSH providers, the annual service plan review, rent collection process, rent and utility allowance calculation, program termination, fair housing, equal access, and a written services plan. So we ended up pulling this as a scored component last year, just due to everyone's capacity at that time. Um, but we are now reincorporating it as a scored component this year. And each policy will be worth up to three points. Um, so that's for a total of 18 points. Now, all of our PSH providers, um, you did submit these policies to me last between last spring and last fall. Sometime over the course of the last year, these were submitted um, you know, based on our request that you submit them. So those submissions, though, have not been reviewed. Essentially, you, you submitted them to me, and I kind of filed them away. So at this point, um, PSH providers will have the opportunity to resubmit your policies um, or you may choose to simply have the policies that you submitted last year um, be the ones that are, are reviewed. Um, so say you submitted a policy to me last fall and over the past few months, you know, internally, maybe you've made some changes, maybe you've taken another look at it and it's the policy is now different from what you submitted last fall. You can essentially kind of swap them out and say, you know, 
I'm resubmitting an updated policy, don't use the one I used last fall. Or if you've made no changes, um, and I'll show you where you do this in the application, you'll be able to say, I'm not resubmitting, just go ahead and use the ones I submitted last fall. All of our PSH providers received a link to a Google Drive that included those policies you submitted last fall, because if you're like me, you'd be like, I don't remember what I submitted, and I can't find it buried in my files. So. Um, I sent you a link that included everything that you turned into me last fall, so you can take a look at it, be refreshed and be reminded, and then make your own decision from there on um, whether you want to resubmit or, or not. So if you did not receive that link, um, let me know. It did go to someone in your agency, um, but if I need to send it to someone else, I can certainly do so. Um, let me pause and going to take a look at Jean's question because it is relevant here. Uh, so for so Jean, it's it's the policy itself that is reviewed and scored. Um, and when I get, hopefully I'll answer this question perhaps a little bit more thoroughly too when I get to one of the appendices in this document, which lays out some of the criteria that our review committee will be looking for um, within the, the body of the policy itself. Um, so if you if you still find, Gene, that I'm not answering your question, just kind of circle back to it. Um, so going on for some additional changes. So um, moving now to our uh, time-limited programs, our rapid rehousing, uh, the, again, our joint component project in our transitional housing project. One of the key components that we look at are access to permanent housing. Again, these are short-term programs, and so we want to make sure that people are exiting to permanent housing. So um, we modified the scoring scale a bit for those projects, again, like everything else, in light of um, the pandemic, in light of kind of what we heard through the public comment process as well. Couple of additional changes for these projects. Um, again, when looking at utilization rates, that fifth date was added that applies to these projects also. And then a new component for these projects, um, talking about the policy review for our rapid rehousing and our TH um, and the, our one joint component project, we will be reviewing and scoring the program termination policy. So PSH providers have six policies that need to be submitted. Um, rapid transitional housing, the joint component project just have one, the program termination policy, and um, this that one policy for these other programs that are, excuse me, it's going to be reviewed and scored. If you are a provider that has both the PSH and RAPID, um, you will have the opportunity to essentially use the same policy, um, which again, I'll show you where you would do that in the application materials. Um, but just know for rapid rehousing, transitional housing, and the joint component project that this is a new evaluation element that we've added. And it's been added um, for a number of reasons. One, it's a regulatory requirement that you have a program termination policy in place. Um, but, but more than that, too, we really want to see and make sure that uh, as a part of you know, project quality that, you know, uh, termination is occurring in, you know, sort of a last resort. We want to ensure that the policy clearly lays out the, how clients have the right to appeal internally within your organization, you know, that there's sort of the right protocol there um, to give clients proper notice, proper opportunity to appeal that decision, and that, you know, every other effort is made um, before you get to that termination point. So we feel that's important, not just for our PSH programs, but really for all of our programs. The next change that was made has to do with spending rates. So every agency, every um, project, I should say, is evaluated on the extent to which it fully expended its most recent um, COC grant. And there are two different scoring scales, depending on if uh, the project has a rental assistance line or, or not. Um, we've always had two different scales. Um, and again, we modified those scoring scales a bit, kind of, kind of took down the, um, lowered a bit the maximum percentage a project had to be at in order to earn full points. Again, just in light of the fact that with the pandemic, um, that may have impacted your spending. You know, if you had 
staff vacancies that were harder to fill or if it's taking longer to move people into housing so you're not paying rent, that's all of that's gonna impact your spending rates. I will say overall, everyone was looked really pretty good in terms of spending, um, but nonetheless recognized that there could have been some challenges there. So we did um, make a modification to that. Um, the other thing I do wanna point out here, this is not a change, but just wanna remind folks of this that um, we do have sort of this language here that if there are outstanding audit findings in a um, you know, auditing report or a funder monitoring report that there could be 10 points deducted from the project score. And we define what we mean by outstanding there. Um, outstanding meaning that there's been either no corrective action plan submitted. And this is particularly if it's to another funder you know, if that time, rate, time frame for getting that submission to the funder has passed and you've, you know, there's been no response, or if the corrective action plan that was submitted was not accepted by the funder. Um, so just you know, be mindful of this, that this, these monitoring reports are likewise something that we um, will be looking at um, and that we do kind of look at closely. The next section um, has to do all with HMIS. There's no changes here. So this is one section where we've, we've, we've not made any changes. A couple of things that I will um, just want to make you aware of and be mindful of. A couple of the probably two biggest things that we um, score folks on here. One is UDE, the Universal Data Elements Completion. So uh, in the application materials, we provide a list of all of the projects that are your agency reports into HMIS uh, minus warming centers or street outreach programs. And it is all of those projects that we take into consideration when we look at your universal data element completion, your UDE completion. Uh, that's because having this data in our system is key to everything. And so even, so that's why we do open it up and look at more than just your COC funded project. We're going to look at your UDE completion rates uh, for all of your projects. And just as a reminder too, for this component and for the next component, this, the known exit destinations, we're looking back on 2020. So for some, in some cases, we're looking at data that at this point is a year old, maybe more than a year old. So it is really our um, kind of expectation that this data um, has been entered at this point, um, particularly because, again, we are going back to, um, to over the course of 2020. For the UDE completion component, this is um, the report that we use in HMIS. It's the 252 data completeness report card. This is not something that you have to submit with your application materials this year. Our HMIS system administrators are going to run this data um, on our end. And so you may recall last year there was a bit of a situation where when agencies were trying to generate these reports kind of at your level, the data was not coming through accurately just because of the sharing that we have. So this is a report that we'll be will be generating on our end. You don't have to submit anything, um, but you know, you do want to make sure you have the data. Um, accurate and complete. For the next kind of component with this, again, there's no change. This is looking at known exit destinations. Um, it's similarly, this is a knowing where people are exiting to is a key element for our overall system data. Um, this is an attachment you will have to include with your application. Um, and uh, well, you'll have to include the you know, appropriate projects within it. Uh, this looks to ensure that you are exiting people from HMIS to a known destination. Whether that destination is permanent housing or, or not, um, what this element is really looking at is, do you know where the clients are going? Do you know what their exit destination is? So that's really what, what this element is intended to get at. Um, so the next component, the next scored component looks at consumer participation. So this first part here has been standard for a number of years. Um, we wanna look to see that you have a consumer who's participated in your agency's board of directors or an equivalent um, decision-making, policy-making entity within your agency. 
Um, there's, you know, you, this is something that you will have to affirm within the application and submit documentation of. We know that there's some agencies who uh, just protect the, you know, kind of uh, identity of the consumer, don't disclose that person's name, which is fine. You know, then you just, you need to submit something on an agency letterhead. So we do make accommodations for that if it's your uh, protocol to keep that information a little bit more confidential. Um, the one change that we are making this year, and this is highlighted in yellow, um, that, uh, so for this year, if your agency responds that uh, you, over the course of 2020, you had no consumer participation, um, but you do have a plan kind of in place to gain that, um, that in next year's competition, it's expected that you'll be able to demonstrate progress on that plan to secure consumer participation. Um, and then if you're not able to demonstrate that in the 2020 competition, um, that you will earn zero points next year. Because um, so we really want to be intentional about ensuring that we are incorporating consumer voice within our organizations. And so this is a way that we really just want to kind of take that accountability kind of up a notch. Um, likewise, if in this year's application, if your uh, response is that you had no participation over the past year and you have no plans on how to do so, that we're going to be uh, looking at putting your agency on a corrective action plan just to um, address that um, deficiency. Um, again, not only is it a regulatory requirement, um, but if we want to make sure that we are incorporating consumer voice into our programming, both at the systems level and at your agency level. Um, again, this is another component, which I will say historically, for the most part, um, everyone meets this bar, is able to demonstrate consumer participation. Um, but just, you know, we're adding sort of this slight change to language, um, again, just to ensure, you know, accountability across the board. I'm gonna, gonna, again, moving on, anything that I'm not touching on is really has had no change from the prior year. Um, so moving on to uh, participation in coordinated entry. So the one thing that's uh, been reincorporated uh, from last year is reporting on referral outcomes. So this was something, this is one of those elements we had temporarily set aside last year, excuse me, um, because of the pandemic that we're now kind of reincorporating. But what this essentially is looking at for the referrals that you've received to your project over the course of 2020, we're going to be looking uh, to see uh, the, with that referral outcome in HMIS to see if that referral was accepted, declined, or canceled. Um, that is really one of the key ways that we know, you know, how referrals are being attended to and to make sure that no one is kind of falling through the cracks. Um, and, you know, as we identify you, you, we know that you may have some transfers. You may have a program entry in 2020 for a person that was transferred from another program. Uh, we can, you know, we can see that on our end. We take that into account. You know, that's not something that you're going to be penalized for. Um, but the kind of the key thing again is is seeing your your referrals over the course of 2020. If again you went in and you made that note that it was um, accepted, declined, or canceled. So. That's um, an element we had intended to look at that last year, but again, we set it aside temporarily. So we're bringing that one back around. Um, and the last uh, couple of changes. So this next section is for our coordinated entry lead agencies, just this minor change um, for this uh, component. Sorry, I'm scrolling through. This is uh, a slight change. Um, so the Southwest Counseling Solutions as our coordinated entry lead agency provides irregular data reports to the COC board. Um, those are provided, uh, they're included in the board packet. And in the past, we would look at a quarterly data. We're just simply adding um, either quarterly or annual data in recognition that of, kind of all of the data that the coordinated entry lead did um, submit to the COC board this past year. And then the last change that I want to point out, this is for our HMIS lead agency grants. So HAND is the HMIS lead agency, meaning we receive a direct grant from HUD for the HMIS implementation. 
And historically, one of the uh, kind of main sources of um, scoring for these uh, grants or this grant is we apply the score that we receive in the COC application on the HMIS section in the COC application, and we essentially apply that locally. The, so HUD evaluates our HMIS implementation on a number of things, like do we have the right policies and procedures in place? What's our bed coverage? What's our data quality? Are we able to meet HUD's reporting deadlines? Um, are we compliant with HUD's expectations? And then HUD gives us a score on the extent to which we implement that and, and meet HUD's expectations. And so we historically apply that score from the COC application locally. So really what this highlighted point is saying, because there was no 2020 application, no 2020 score, we're essentially going back to the 2019 application um, and applying that score locally here this year because there was no 2020 competition. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, take a pause to see if there's any questions. I don't see anything else in the chat box. Um, so we'll just pause for a moment, see if there's substantiated grievances. Okay, thank you, Pat. Let me actually, I did go back. I did, let me go back to that point because that is something that I think will be relevant to everyone. Sorry, I'm scrolling through a lot here. Okay. Um, this was a change and I should have highlighted that as a change as well. Okay, so Pat's uh, question is asking, would a substantiated grievance in a warming center or a shelter deduct points from a PSH project? If so, why? Um, they are very different projects. Yes, that is true. So last year, I'm going to give a little bit of history. <laughs> so last year uh, was the first year that we incorporated um, essentially deducting points from a COC project score if there were substantiated grievances against that project. Um, and the number of points that could have been deducted were based on the severity of that grievance um, and the, ex if the, you know, the extent to which the agency complied with what was expected of them. So last year was the first year we did that and we looked just at the COC project um, specifically. So this year, what we're doing is that we're really taking it a step further. And we did indicate in the application materials last year that this was really kind of um, in part of the plan and sort of in the works. So this year, um, what we're saying is that if an agency has a substantiated grievance against a non-COC funded program, so a shelter, say a shelter program that the city funds, and that, that the grievance is filed and is substantiated, and that's a, an important point because not all grievances are substantiated. Um, if that grievance is substantiated and if we see that the agency retaliated against the client or was not compliant with the grievance committee's um, you know, directives, then there would be points deducted from all of that agency's COC funded programs. And so a couple of things. So there's a couple of pretty significant things that have to happen. One, the grievance has to be substantiated. And secondly, it has to be, there has to be a sort of a severe um, enough sort of situation that happened that we see the agency retaliated against the client um, or that the agency was just not compliant with the grievance committee's instructions. So that, that's a pretty kind of significant occurrence uh, for that to happen. And if that did happen, then points would be deducted from um, all of the COC project scores. And the rationale behind that, and I, I, you know, I understand a shelter program is different than a COC funded program. Why are we, you know, why are we making that connection? And the, the kind of thought behind it is uh, if it gets to the point where an agency is retaliating against a client or is not compliant with a grievance committee's um, the directives, that's likely speaking to a broader agency culture and a cultural concern within the agency that is concerning. Um, that at that point where it's maybe signifying that there's more than just you know, a specific thing happening within this program, but there's a larger um, kind of agency issue that's going on here. Um, and so because of that, um, 
you know, we want to take that into consideration with all of the homelessness program funding that that agency is receiving. So that's really kind of the um, uh, rationale behind that. And uh, so, yeah, and, and, and again, um, I, I will say too, because uh, we are looking at substantiated grievances that were filed in 2020, if you are an agency um, to whom this applies, you would have received notice at this point from the grievance committee of any grievances that were substantiated. That was something that was a new process that we put in place this past year um, where you would have gotten, you know, as that grievance was filed, if it, as it was you know, investigated, if things were substantiated, there would have been kind of that, that feedback that occurred kind of in real time for lack of a better word. Um, you would have already received this information. So, um, okay, so glad, good, I'm glad that helps. Um, and again, we are anticipating that to be, you know, hopefully rare occurrences. Again, it's another way that we really try to um, elevate consumer voice and to really you know, say that we take, we, we take seriously um, the, the concerns that our consumers bring to us. There was another comment there uh, from Jamie. I just want to pause a moment. <clears throat> so Jamie's question is, were policies scored last year even though there was no new funding? Um, so no. So you're, uh, I'm assuming you're meaning the PSH policies that were submitted. They were not scored. Um, I will be honest with you, you, you sent them to me and I filed them away and that is where they have been. Uh, so they, they were not scored. Um, and that's why we're bringing the, the scoring back this year. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, so uh, again, I went over the some of the key changes within the scoring criteria. Um, a lot of this additional information is, um, I'm not gonna go over it here. It just gives some more context on, you know, which entity is responsible for what with these scored components. You know, how are we gonna take in, um, to consideration maybe sort of some unique things that might come up during the, the review of projects. So all of that is there, again, just for transparency's sake, um, and so that you, know, you can kind of read through all that um, on your own. A couple of things I do want to touch on as well in terms of potential future scoring criteria, future evaluation criteria. So uh, we, we do what we can you know, to kind of give you as much of a heads up as, as possible to know what to be aware of in coming years. So uh, the one thing that you should be aware of is that any evaluation criteria um, that we look at this year may be included as score criteria in future competitions. Um, again, this is language we've included in our application materials you know, consistently for the past couple of years. Specifically, some additional things to be aware of. Um, so this first one I have highlighted here, the completion of the universal data elements and known exit destinations and the housing move-in date completion. Um, so these are very much HMIS related elements. Um, should be aware that in either the 2020 and or future competitions, these scoring scales will likely change in that projects uh, may need to demonstrate a higher percentage of data completion in order to earn these points. These elements, especially housing move-in dates, um, but also the universal data elements, knowing the exit destinations, these are so key to our overall system data, um, especially housing move-in dates. For those of you who come to the rapid rehousing or the PSH work groups, you know how much we talk about housing move-in dates. So having this data is so key to our overall system data um, that, that you may want to anticipate in future years, we may be looking at higher rates of completion uh, within those scoring scales. I will say you all do an amazingly wonderful job, good job for the most part <laughs> on your data. You know, we all have room for improvement sometimes. Um, I know that you all do work really hard at it. I know that it is not easy, especially 
during these times when you may be experiencing some you know, staffing challenges, um, but just wanted to keep you aware that uh, this is an element we'll continue to look at and that we may be you know, kind of raising the bar too. These data elements are also the kind of thing where as you know, the more that you look at them regularly within your own agency on a monthly or quarterly basis and clean things up and address things um, as they need to be addressed, um, the better everyone is gonna be overall. So just wanted to give you that heads up. The, uh, again, I'm not reading through all of this, um, but you can certainly read through it on your own. I just want to highlight a couple of additional things. So we removed some scored criteria this year that we had included in prior competitions. And just as a heads up that those elements may come back in the future. Um, because of the pandemic over the course of 2020, there were some things that we just are not scoring you on this year, such as length of time to housing. That was something we looked at um, last year when we looked back on 2019. We know that in 2020, it took a lot longer to move people into housing. So we didn't even include that as a scored criteria this year, but that may come back in the future. Um, certainly we always wanna move people into housing as quickly as possible. And so when it's appropriate for us to reincorporate that, you know, that will come back around. Um, meeting attendance at COC meeting and work group meeting attendance in 2020, we are not including as a scored criteria just because um, we all, you had enough meetings to go to in 2020 and getting to some of those may have been challenging. Excuse me, and there were a couple of additional ones as well for our coordinated entry projects that we removed um, the training just because uh, you know, some, you know, some limits on what could have been provided there um, over the course of 2020, and then some things that MISHDA monitors um, that they did not monitor in 2020. So those were removed as well. Additionally, any scoring scales, <clears throat> excuse me, that may have been adjusted downward in response to the pandemic may in a future competition kind of revert back to what they were prior um, or be additionally changed. You know, every year when we're pulling the scoring scales together, um, we always look at, you know, what is our data telling us? Um, I, I, you know, look at the HMIS data to try to get a sense of where we are at that time to really uh, see, you know, how are things looking this year? What what's, uh, seems reasonable? You know, we always want to find this balance between um, promoting better performance as well as, uh, you know, having things that, again, are, are reasonable given the environment that you're working within. Excuse me. Um, I see Dan's, I'm pausing for another question. Um, yes, this handout that I'm going over right now is available on our website and I will um, show you how to access it towards the end of um, this presentation. Okay, I'm going to move on now. So now I'm going to move into the actual application form itself. So this document, this is what you're going to be downloading. It's uh, available on our website in a Word format. This is what you're going to download, fill out, and email to me by June 17th. So um, again, I'm hi I've highlighted a few things that are a little bit different from um, last year or maybe changed a bit that I just want to make sure you are aware of. So this first page, the first two pages actually are a checklist. And this is really important that this be filled out because this tells me what I should be expecting to be included in your application packet. So please fill out this checklist. Um, if it's not applicable, indicate so. Um, so I, so you basically, so you're not penalized for not including something that you weren't gonna include. So one of the changes, uh, his, typically we always ask that you submit your uh, any monitoring reports from the city of Detroit for homelessness funding you may receive, either ESG or CDBG funding, um, uh, or a HUD monitoring report, uh, or any communication related to those reports. Um, in the past, we've, we've had you go back a few years to, you know, pull up things from a couple of years ago. So this year, uh, for these monitoring reports, all that you need to submit is anything that you have on file between that you received from either the city or HUD from January of 2020 to March of 2021. 
And that may not be much of anything. We know that there was not a lot of monitoring that really happened over the course of 2020. Um, so you may not have anything to submit. Um, we, we, again, try to sort of make this a little bit easier because I have your everything else you submitted from prior to 2020, I already have that on file. Um, so I'm not gonna ask you to resubmit something um, that you submitted last year. So for city monitoring or HUD monitoring, we're really just looking for anything that you have between January of 2020 and March of 2021. <clears throat> um, and this checklist here for your uh, permanent, your PSH policies. So again, this gets to, you have the opportunity to not resubmit. If you are choosing to not resubmit um, these policies, then you're gonna just select NA in this checklist. Uh, that, and there's another question later on in the application where you'll indicate the same. Um, but that essentially is, is one of the two ways you'll be communicating to me that you're not resubmitting. If you are resubmitting, then you wanna, you know, check the appropriate box. And you can mix and match. Say you wanna resubmit your rent collection process policy, but everything else is the same, you can resubmit just the one and not the others. Um, so it's really up to you to decide how you wanna do that. If you are a, um, if you have a rapid rehousing, a joint component project or a transitional housing project, and you also have a permanent supportive housing project, you can use the same program termination policy for your rapid rehousing joint component or TH projects. And um, if you choose to do so, again, you're gonna select NA on this checkbox. Uh, for a couple of uh, agencies on this call who have rapid rehousing or TH but not PSH, you're gonna have to submit this program termination policy um, because I've not received it from you up until this point. Um, and then this is the, the HUD monitoring reports that I've already mentioned. Okay, the rest of the attachments are really pretty much the same. I, again, for some of you, the, you may not have many attachments to provide, which is fine. Um, for others, you may have a few more. Um, so I'm going into the application now itself. Um, and again, I want to just highlight a few additional things. So again, I've already touched on this. These, the city monitoring report, we're really just looking for stuff from January 2020 to March of 2021. So if you have nothing, just put a check no and respond to NA for attachments four through eight. If you do have something that you've received from the city in that time frame, um, then just you know indicate what it was and submit that attachment. Likewise with HUD, um, same same kind of thing. Um, it, you know what what you have in in. Some of you, you may have received a notification from HUD, you know, maybe in March of 2021, you got an email from HUD that, hey, we're going to come out and monitor you later this spring or later this summer. Even just that we do, we do want. So you would include that just as a notification from HUD that your project will be monitored and just send me a copy of that email. That's all I would need. Understandably, you're not going to have that monitoring report from them until, you know, later this fall. So then you'll submit that monitoring report next year. Um, so just go through this, you know, and, and determine what you have and submit it appropriately. Um, I'm kind of scrolling through a lot of this because there's not a ton of changes here. And again, I want to just highlight some of the changes. So uh, there are some informational only questions that we are asking you to respond to. And I do in, in clarify that these are not scored this is information that we're collecting just to really help us better understand our programs and help us to understand kind of what's happening on the ground. So this question around evictions and program terminations, again, it's informational only. We asked this of our permanent supportive housing projects last year. And so now we're asking all of our project types to answer this question. So really what, and I, I give some kind of verbiage and define some things what we mean by eviction versus termination. Um, they, they may mean different things, but essentially we wanna know um, who is who in your program faced eviction and ultimately was evicted or who faced termination and ultimately was terminated from your program over the past year. And 
we understand too that with the eviction moratorium that has been in place um, over the course of 2020, that that you know likely really had an impact on who who faced eviction or who kind of got that far down the road. We totally get that. Um, we still are asking you to complete this information nonetheless. Um, again, it's really helpful for us to understand um, you know, what was happening on the ground. And this is sort of a nuanced part of the data that isn't uh, fully captured in HMIS. And so this helps us to get a better understanding of um, you know, really what's happening within your programs. It's informational only. Um, so we do ask that you um, complete that. Another informational only question is the staff to client ratio. Um, again, this was something you completed last year. So you, the information you submit this year may be the same um, or it may be different. Um, you know, we know that some agencies had different staffing patterns uh, change over the past year. Again, this helps us to better understand our, our projects. So just ask that you would complete that information as well. Um, this question on project potential project straddling, um, I do give a lot of sort of narrative context here. Um, so this is another piece of information that's not scored. It's helpful for us when we do get to the process of when we have to rank our projects within tier one and tier two. There's always going to be a project that's kind of on the line between tier one and tier two. And so what this question is asking is um, really if HUD would only fund sort of the tier one of your project, how feasible would your project be at a lesser funding amount if HUD only does fund the tier one? Um, gathering this information up front is really helpful so that we, when we do get to the ranking process, um, we don't have to kind of go back and then get this information from you at that time. It's a little bit more um, helpful to our process to kind of collect it up front at this point. But if you have any questions about what I'm asking here, once you get into it, don't hesitate to reach out. <clears throat> a couple of additional questions. Um, again, this next one is informational only. And this uh, part L, L really only applies to um, one project at this point that's specifically funded uh, for persons fleeing domestic violence or human trafficking. And it's um, and the, really just asking for a description of how the project helped to increase the safety of persons fleeing domestic violence or human trafficking. So again, informational only, it helps us to better understand um, the programming and how you know, this, this program helped to improve uh, the safety of those clients. <clears throat> okay, so I touched on this briefly. So this part M applies to our rapid rehousing, our joint component project and our transitional housing projects. So this year, you do need to submit your program termination policy. That policy is going to be reviewed and scored. You can earn up to three points for that policy. Uh, if you are an agency who has one of these three project types, um, rapid, a joint component, um, or TH, we actually don't have any TH providers that also have PSH. But if you are a PSH provider, also has one of these project types. And if in your agency internally, the you, your program termination policy that you use for say your rapid rehousing program is the same program termination policy for your PSH program. Um, and you wanna, you don't have to resubmit the same policy because it's the same policy it's, you apply it to, you know, your programs the same way. So you could just select this option one. And what that's communicating to us is that whatever score is received on that program termination policy, we're gonna apply that score not only to your PSH projects, but to your rapid rehousing project as well. Cause you're essentially telling us it's the same policy. So we're just gonna apply that score across the board to all of your projects. However, option two here, um, either your agency does not have a permanent supportive housing project, or maybe you have different termination policies for these different project types. Um, if that's the case, then you're gonna indicate so by selecting option two, you are then going to submit that policy as attachment 18, and you're gonna let us know if kind of if that policy has been approved by your agency or if it's not yet approved, um, kind of where you are with that. So we tried to make this, try to you know, acknowledge the fact that 
our PSH providers, you know, have some overlap with these other project types and to, again, kind of cut down some of the burden of, if you like you're submitting the same thing twice for the same purpose, um, try to streamline that a little bit. But again, if you do not have a permanent supportive housing project, then you absolutely have to select option two and submit that attachment as attachment 18, um, because otherwise I won't have it. <clears throat> okay, the next kind of section with parts N through Q, this is just for our permanent supportive housing projects. Some of these questions are the same as last year. You're just gonna respond to the questions in the application. So part Q, again, this is where we get to these policies. Um, if you, again, are choosing not to resubmit, you're gonna, um, just like you did with the checklist up above where you selected NA, um, you're gonna put a check in this box here. Um, we're saying the policy is not being resubmitted, but the policy that was submitted in 2020 is the one to be used for further review. So this is further how you're gonna communicate to me that you're not resubmitting. Um, and again, like I said before, if you want to resubmit some of your policies, but not all, you can, you know, mix and match and, and do what you need to do, um, kind of based on uh, your, your choice. Um, so that's, again, how you would uh, indicate that here. Okay, the next uh, section, parts R through Y, this is just for our coordinated entry lead and implementing partner. So um, again, these are the questions that they will go through um, and respond to. I'm not gonna go over those in great detail. Um, just scroll on through there. The signature page, this applies to everyone. The language in this has not changed from years past. So this is just kind of your agency agreeing to and affirming kind of a number of things. So just please be sure to read through this. Um, submit, you know, this as an attachment, electronic signatures are absolutely okay. Um, okay, so now we're kind of moving into the appendices of this document. So appendix A here um, really gets into the details of this policy submission and the scoring scales. So uh, the last time we reviewed these PSH policies as a scored component was in the 2019 competition. And again, we intended to do it in 2020, but then our plans changed. And so now we're bringing it back here um, around in 2021. So how do your policies are gonna be scored? There's, uh, they can each earn up to three points. So for PSH projects, because you're submitting six policies, that's up to 18 points that you could earn. Other projects, you're submitting the one policy, so that's up to three points. Um, this is the scoring scale that our reviewers are gonna be looking at. Each policy will be reviewed by at least three people, um, similar to how we do things for new projects. Um, you know, each reviewer will give it a score based on that three point scale, and then that will, uh, those scores will be averaged together. And essentially the reviewers are gonna be looking for the extent to which your policies included these uh, recommended elements um, that we have for each policy. Um, and the extent to which the, the policy kind of fits within this policy framework. So for each policy, um, we have, there's a number of recommended elements to that we would want to see within the policy. And there's for each of them kind of these, this bullet point list. And so the policy will be evaluated on the extent to which it includes those recommended elements. So these recommended elements for the first five policies were developed a couple of years ago um, through conversations with our providers. It uh, really is an outcome of what we saw when HAND and CSH did site visits in 2018. Um, that was really where these kind of recommended elements kind of um, came from. With the exception of the policy number six, the written services plan, um, the recommended elements for that policy, we pulled from uh, the PS, I'm sorry, the CSH's dimensions of quality um, self-assessment tool is where we pulled some of those, those criteria. So what I would recommend, um, let me see, in Jean's question with these, policies scored for the content. So these policies were scored in 2019. Yep. Um, so 
for, uh, for all of our PSH providers, when I sent you the link to the Google Drive that included your policies that you submitted in 2020, I also included the feedback that you received from when these policies were reviewed in 2019. So um, what you may wanna do, what I would suggest is that you look at the feedback you received from 2019 um, and to see if there's, and if perhaps you've already made changes to your policy, um, perhaps you haven't, um, but I would you know, look at that feedback that was provided for you to as sort of like a way to jog our memories on uh, the feedback from the review team the last time these policies were reviewed. So take that, it would take that, you know, compare it to these recommended elements, because this is, these recommended elements are also what the review team looked at in 2019. So there's really been no changes. Um, and then compare that to what your policies look like now. Um, and, you know, use that as a way to determine kind of what course of action you want to take. If you want to, again, make some changes and resubmit your policies if what you've submitted in 2020 you feel good about and want to move forward with those, that's fine too. Um, so it really is going to be um, up to you. It's, it's up to your agency to decide how you want to move forward with that. But again, um, when you, you know, kind of to the question of like, you know, what are, what are the reviewers going to be looking for in these policies? That is the information here in this Appendix A. These are the elements that they're going to be looking for. So that's what I would refer to. Um, the additional appendices, I'm just going to kind of quickly touch on these just so you know what's there. Um, so this Appendix B, this renewal project spending, um, this, there's nothing you need to submit to me for your agency spending unless you were really underspent. Uh, that is a question in, in the application. But this is all information I pulled from your APRs in SAGE that you've already reported to HUD. Um, it's essentially telling you um, how much of your most recent grant award was expended. Um, so for the most part, these are projects that ended, uh, you know, some part in the early part of 2020. There are a couple of projects for whom the, lap, the final report um, has not yet been submitted, but um, will be submitted by the time the scoring is completed. So. That information is all there. I mean, it's another way for us to be, you know, transparent um, as well. So you can see what our projects across the board look like with their spending. Appendix C. Um, so hopefully everyone knows how to generate their APR from HMIS, um, just in case you don't. And I um, have a bit of a typo here that I'm seeing right here. Your APR needs to be for calendar year 2020. Um, this says right here, 2019, it should be 2020, calendar year 2020. This is the, one of the main sources of data that we are looking at is your APR data. So be sure to submit your cal calendar year 2020 APR with your project uh, for the correct HMIS ID. These HMIS ID numbers are all given here. This is just for your COC funded program. Um, so if you're drawing a blank on which project ID you need to run that APR on, that is all included here. Appendix D, so we referred earlier to these two HMIS components that look at uh, the data completeness, the data quality report, and the known uh, destination report. And we indicated that that would be looked at for all projects that you have in HMIS, not just your COC funded project. So the Appendix D gives you the list of which projects we're talking about. Um, we do not include warming centers or street outreach programs, but essentially everything else is, is included. Warming centers and street outreach are excluded just because we know there's a lot less kind of client contacts within those programs. Um, and so we do exclude those. All of your other projects are with you know, one or two kind of exceptions are included. Um, so just again, this is another way for us to be um, transparent and clear on what is uh, what we're looking at. And then uh, also when you submit that um, known destination report, um, you're going to need to be sure to include all of your projects in that report as well. The last appendix is 
um, the scoring for substantiated grievances. I, I did explain some of this verbally a bit, but this um, really just kind of says in writing some of what I described earlier regarding the deduction of points, excuse me, if you had, um, even if it was a substantiated grievance from a non-COC funded program. Um, so that gives some more, just sort of a description there as well. Um, okay, so that is the, um, sorry, let me, let me switch my screen a moment. The application material. So as I switch over, are there other questions that I can answer? Sorry, I am um, having a moment here. I'm gonna pause. I see if there's any other questions that folks wanna drop in the chat box. Oops. Do, do, do. All right. Uh, let me catch up to myself here. Do, 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 do. Okay, so I'm gonna just real quick touch on a couple of things that I've been mentioned before in terms of your APRs. Um, calendar year APR that you need to submit. This is probably gonna be different from your project term. Um, very few uh, COC grants have operate on a calendar year. We have a couple that do, but very rarely. Uh, but submit it for the calendar year, not your project term. That is a change we made a number of years ago. That means that helps make sure that we are looking at the same time frame for all of our projects over the course of um, 2020. Um, so every uh, let me. Uh, switch over. I'm going to show you where everything is on our website as well. So all of these materials that I've gone over today are posted on our website. So on our website here, which uh, continuumofcare.org slash funding. So the packet of the PDF document that I was just scrolling through is posted here. It's that so the PDF form, that's kind of 59 page document. It's posted there. The application form is posted as a Word document. So just that application form so you can download it and fill it out. I had great dreams this year of having some kind of like online application portal. Um, but that didn't work. So some year, perhaps, you won't have to like email me this with all these attachments. We'll get there someday. Um, but this is posted here for, for you to download. Um, I will also be posting for any of you who may be interested in considering applying for new project funding. That material will be posted here by the end of the day tomorrow as well. So you can kind of come back to that. Um, what also is posted on our website are the self-scoring tools. So there's a different tool for each project type. Um, I'll show you real quick on what this is. Again, if you're not familiar with it. So this, what I'm showing is your, the self-scoring tool for permanent supportive housing uh, projects. This is an optional tool and it's something that um, you can use and you can look at if you, if you choose. What this really does, it goes into all the details of how we calculate these percentages and your score. So it goes for each um, scored component, it goes into which APR question are we looking at? Essentially, how are we doing the math to come up with this score? So if you are really interested in this, you can look at these self-scoring tools. You can use this tool to get a sense of, you know, how's my project shaping up? Um, what can I kind of anticipate um, to, to give you a sense of where you might land? This is, again, it's completely optional. It's for your use only. But it is, again, another way for us to be transparent and to communicate how we, how we do the math, how we come up with the numbers that we come up with when we give you this project score. Um, this is 
honestly, this is a tool that we use internally as well as we're reviewing projects. Um, so it's something that, you know, hand staff uses as well, um, in addition to, you know, um, what, what you can use also. So also on our website as some additional um, policies, again, some of these that just have not changed in terms of our appeals policy, the entire process of how projects are reviewed and ranked, that's all laid out there in a policy. Um, the responses that we received to the public comments, I referenced that we had a public comment period earlier this spring, the comments that we received and the uh, responses to those comments is all available here as well. So you can um, review that also. Once the CUC board approves the project priority ranking and reallocation policies, um, this will likewise be um, posted here as well. Um, so let me see, I see another comment. Um, are these all story problems? So not, I think you were referring to the self-scoring tool. Um, if I felt like I was writing story problems in a way. Um, we really try to show with these self-scoring tools kind of, again, where we get the data from and how the map, how we do the calculations to come up with um, the uh, score criteria for the renewal projects. Mm. All right, I'm going to switch back over again to my presentation. I'm kind of getting to the end of the line here. Um, so again, everything is due to me by June 17th. I did not indicate a time, what time they're due. So up to 11.59 p.m. on the 17th. Um, everything's going to be emailed to me um, at you know, my email address there. Um, if you have, you know, you can send more than one email. You can put things in a zip file if, if you need to. Um, I will, you know, once I get the email, I do you know, sk skim it over to see what's there and I will send you an email confirmation of the receipt of your application. All right, so that is the end of kind of what I had. Um, so I will just pause to see if there's any additional questions that I can answer from folks. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So we'll just know we were scheduled to go until four, but I don't want to, you know, keep you any longer than we have to. So I'll just, um, I would say if you want to, you can unmute yourself um, or type a question in the chat box. Okay. And as you, I mean, and I know I kind of went through a lot of material in a relatively short period of time. So once you get into, you know, looking at the application and starting to fill things out, um, you know, please do not hesitate to reach out to me with questions. Um, I would, um, <laughs> I would much rather have, um, you reach out to get clarification. I, I'm not sure what to submit. What are you looking for here? Um, please, you know, I'd rather have you reach out to get clarification rather than kind of submitting the wrong thing. Um, so please do feel free um, to reach out um, to get clarification as as we go along. And I also, I'll, I, I meant to acknowledge this too. I know the city recently released their ESG application and we really do try between hand and the city, we try to prevent overlap when we can um, with having two applications out at the same time. We know it is a extreme um, challenge when you're working and we have different applications open at the same time. So we do try to be mindful of that. We both the city and hand you know, are under certain timing constrictions as well that we have to um, kind of adhere to. So uh, we apologize that we weren't able to completely avoid that overlap. Um, but, but we do try to be mindful of that. So seeing no other questions, I am going to, again, thank you for your time and again, don't hesitate to reach out and thank you all for your time today and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks everyone.